envelopes are now available for pickup in the narthex. The poinsettias, if you ordered a poinsettia, you are welcome to take it home anytime after today's service. Pastor B is still visiting church members. Remember to schedule a meeting with him if you haven't already. Are there any other announcements? Advent calendar? Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope, remembering the hope which comes in Christ, the candle of peace, remembering God's dream of a peaceful world, and the candle of joy, remembering the spirit within us who brings joy. Today we light the fourth candle of Advent, the candle of love. Scripture tells us there is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 
God created this world in love, and this world will end in the love of God. God love pervades all aspects of this life, from birth to death, pain to delight, strangers to lovers. God's love is there. We light this candle in love. On this day, we remember God is love. Please stand and join me in singing hymn number 213, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. Please join me in the call to worship. Stir up your strength and come to save us. Restore us, O oh God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. For we know that you light the sun. A child will change us all. Let your hand be upon him in blessing. For he will bring you near. He will be God with us. Give us life, O oh God, and we, we will forever call on your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, God of every nation and people, from the very beginning of creation, you have made manifest your love. When our need for a Savior was great, you sent your Son to be born of the Virgin Mary. To our lives, he brings joy and peace, justice, mercy, hope, and love. Our Lord God, bless all who look upon this manger. May it remind us of the humble birth of Jesus and raise our thoughts to him who is perfect God and man, God with us and Savior of all and, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. As we rely on the precious blood of Christ, cleanse us from all our sins, willful and unwitting, and receive us. Renew our hearts and fill us with your Holy Spirit promised. And may our worship be acceptable and pleasing to you. 
And Father, remind all authorities and leaders of our country that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And bless them and guide them and use them to establish your coming kingdom. And Father, remember all those in various trials and weaknesses of life. Fill us with the peace of Christ. Strengthen us by your mighty hand. Lead us by the truth and the Holy Spirit. And let us remain in your presence and walk with our Lord Jesus Christ day by day. And as we lift all our prayers and concerns with faith and thanksgiving, let your holy name be glorified through all, and let the people of God pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand, and let us praise with him, O little town of Bethlehem. Please be seated. 
Good morning. The scripture this morning comes from Isaiah and Romans. Isaiah is first, it's chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. You may find it on page 598 in the Old Testament of your Pew Bible. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in, dread, will be deserted. The next reading is from Romans in the New Testament on page 142, and it is chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all God's beloved in Rome, who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God for the people of God. song given to God, all the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Uh, let me read for you today scripture reading, Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, let me read for you. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and didn't want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her 
quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and we and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we have been in the Advent season celebrating, waiting for, and preparing for the coming of our uh, King, the Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And today is the fourth Advent Sunday. And let me remind you that there are three comings of Jesus Christ, the three Advents, Christmas, the first Advent, which is 22,000 years ago, Yet, we have focused more on this season, the Lord's second coming in the future. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going back. Okay. Uh, therefore, I shared how we should prepare for Christ's second coming for three weeks. As Moses said, our life uh, on earth that quickly passes and we fly away, but it is connected and uh, we are heading to our eternity. So he asked God, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom to recognize and prepare for our eternity. Uh, Christmas on earth uh, will not come back someday as we will you know, welcome our King Jesus coming in glory and power. And let's review what we were taught for uh, three Sundays. On the first Advent Sunday, we heard from our Lord directly, keep watch, uh, be continually alert, and be ready, that is, be vigilant for his return. Second Advent Sunday, we heard the calling of John the Baptist. How should we prepare? That is, he said, repent, for the kingdom of God has come. And we heard the repentance that means changing our minds constantly from me-centered thoughts, minds, and life by turning toward God-centered life. And last week, we got a lesson from John again, but through his doubt, uh, which we have sometimes too. And remember, that the remember the truth that, you know, not God does what is right, but that all that God does is right. This is a big difference, right? God does what is right, not that, but that all that God does is right, even though we cannot understand. Understanding our weaknesses, the Lord speaks to all the doubters in his love, which is, blessed is a man who does not fall away on account of on account me. But we should not miss the, Lord, the third advent, that is the Lord who is coming presently and constantly in our hearts and lives. Welcoming and remaining in the Lord is the best way to prepare ourselves for all coming of Jesus Christ. Having done that, we see Jesus Christ who is, yesterday, who is the same yesterday and today and forever in this season. And today we are led to the story how the birth of Jesus Christ came about through which we will see who the baby Jesus is and what he does and how God did that most crucial historical work through ordinary people. By the way, unlike in Luke's gospel, seen through the eyes of Mary, an excited Galilean girl learning that she is to give birth to God's Messiah, the story of Jesus' birth in Matthew's, uh, that is, uh, through the more sober Joseph, uh, discovering that his fiance is uh, pregnant. Then let's look at the text, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. Uh, for the background, verse 2 through 17 in the same chapter explains the genealogy of God's people that is centering on King David. 
However, in verse 16, there is no expression that Joseph gave birth to Jesus. Instead, it records Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary gave birth to Jesus. In other words, today's passage from verse 18 explains how the unborn child between Joseph and Mary can become Joseph's son, the son of King David's line. Verse 18 continues, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. So we see Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. Well, this engagement at the bride's house was much more binding in the first century than today. They wrote a legally binding contract. Therefore, although the couple was expected to remain, you know, uh, celibate and would not live together during that period, they were legally a husband and wife once they were engaged. And this period generally lasted uh, 12 months, and it is a period of testing the fidelity of the husband and the wife. The bride was to ensure her virginity, and the husband prepared a house for the wife at his father's house. And then the wedding took place at the bridegroom's house at the end of the uh, period. Therefore, it was the happiest period as each other kept love and trust as lifelong partners and waited for the wedding with joy, excitement, and joy. But then a fatal, fatal crisis happens in that period. But before they came together, which means living together or physically union, Mary was found to be with child. Mary might have been in her second time stir, you know, her pregnancy was beginning to show as she spent three months uh, with her relative Elizabeth, who conceived John the Baptist uh, six months earlier after that. And it is the worst case scenario that could happen to an engaged couple. It should not happen among the pledged couple because it was breaking the covenant and faith toward the husband. Simply put, it was adultery. So for Joseph, it was shocking news like a bolt out of the blue. What in the world happened to her? She got a baby through the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. It means that Jesus had no human fatherhood, but was supernaturally conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit without physical relationship between Joseph and Mary. Well, Mary had already uh, been noticed of this by the angel. She was heard from the angel. Luke uh, 135 says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Surprisingly, she responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. But she might be an early teenager, you know, but she was a woman of faith. As Elizabeth said about her in verse 45, you are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. The incarnation is the most extraordinary miracle in the Bible and the most profound mystery in the universe. But how could that happen? Pew Research Center shows that 66% of Americans believe in the virgin birth. However, it is declining and it is still a stumbling block to many people. This kind of thing has never happened and will neither. And it is beyond our human reason, science, and natural law. And science has no explanation for the virgin birth of Christ. But yet, it is the story about God, not humans, who created you know, scientific principles and our reason. And it is possible and evident because God's divine power, plan, and providence are involved in it then who the Holy Spirit is, and how could the Spirit do that? Nothing is new for the Spirit's work because the Spirit was always at the work of creation. Genesis 1-2 says, The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over, which means brooded like a bird, the surface of the waters. Psalm 104, 30 says, when you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. 
his spirit also mentioned, is mentioned as the breath of life in Genesis 2-7. The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. So humans, unlike animals, became a spiritual existence through the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit was involved in having God the Son be conceived in bodily form in Mary's womb. It is nothing impossible. And God is a creator, and he is a recreator of all things. But what about Joseph, you know, her husband? The mystery of this birth was entirely unknown to him. As a husband, you have yet to bring your wife into your home to complete the marriage, and you find out that she is pregnant. How did he know that? Well, perhaps Mary told about it to him, and we can imagine, you know, the conversation like, Honey, do you love me? Yes, I do. I love you. What's the matter? I've got something to tell you, something unbelievable. But promise that you won't think I lied to you. Do you truly love me? Sure, sweetheart, you can count on me, so tell me what it is. However, Joseph really didn't or could not believe her. Only one possible explanation in his mind, she has been with another man. It must have been confusing, painful, and disappointing to him by the sense of betrayal and shame. What would you do if you discovered, you know, that the woman you love, the one you have chosen to marry was pregnant right before you took her into your home? If you were me, you know, not only a shock, uh, but anger would, would have reason with a tremendous sense of betrayal. How could you do that to me? Are you cheating on me and getting pregnant with another guy's baby? However, Joseph's reaction was different from that of ordinary man. He does not react to her emotionally, but very calmly, verse 19 because Joseph, her husband, yes, they were in a marriage uh, relation. That's why he was called as her husband, was a righteous man and didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her, to divorce her quietly. We see the two conditions made his quiet divorce. First, Joseph was a righteous man. When you say a Jewish man was righteous, it does not simply mean that he was a good man, but it means he knew the law very well and, he, and, and then he lived his life according to that law. It is explained through the parents of John the Baptist, Luke 1, 6 said, Zechariah and El Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. And when adultery was committed in Judaism, divorce was not an option but a mandatory one, so Joseph had to divorce her. And he realized that obviously she was not the person she, he could uh, be together with and the relationship could be uh, sustained. And he knew Deuteronomy 21, 20 to 21 well enough to know that back then, you know, when a woman became pregnant with a child outside of marriage, the punishment was death by stone because it was adultery. The Jewish community of this time often didn't carry out the death penalty because under Rome, Jews were not given the power to enforce capital punishment, and in many cases, they punished adulteresses through public disgrace. So, uh, therefore, he could go public and shame Mary. Yet, he didn't want to disgrace her publicly. Not like the legalists who were many then, his righteousness was not condemning the sinner. He was different from those who judged and condemned others who were not right with their own standard, thus establishing their own righteousness. Joseph wanted to fulfill the law, but also he showed compassion to his fiance. That's why he decided to break the engagement quietly, even though he couldn't possibly accept Mary's words. He did the best act of love he could. And, you know, Nazareth, where the couple lived, was a small village. The population was just, you know, 100, like 200 or uh, through 500. And all people might know with each other very well. Therefore, public shame would be the end of Mary's uh, normal life. 
And his righteousness prompted his compassion toward Mary. And I saw in him the law and grace together. Righteousness and sympathy coexist and harmonize that just like God the Father is a holy and righteous judge, but also compassionate and merciful and slow to anger. And verse 20, but after he had considered this, when he had already decided to divorce, but like many other godly people, when he was meditating on what happened to him, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream to clarify the child. Well, in the first century, receiving the revelation of God delivered by an angel that was very important in giving the reliability of the revelation. And after that, Joseph received instructions from angels through dreams three more times. And what the angel said was, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. And notice that the angel addresses Joseph as son of David, which reminds us that he is in the line of King David through whom the Messiah would come. Joseph was the 27th generation of King David, but no one would call him like that. It would have been almost forgotten you know, and had, uh, have had little meaning in his life. Since Babylon conquered Judah in B.C. 587, his descendants were scattered, losing all their privileges and living a simple life. Joseph, a carpenter himself, also lived humbly, not in Jerusalem, the king's place, but in Galilee, the land of Gentiles. John 7, 41 says, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? So the people who lived in Judea, they looked down uh, Galileans. Even in the village of Nazareth, among the Galileans, the people looked down on Nazarenes, a place on uh, inhabited for centuries until B.C. 2 century. And one of the 12, Nathaniel, he said in John 1, uh, 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? But God never forget, forgot his lineage and reminded him to prepare him for the promise the Messiah would fulfill. The angel's message was, was not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. In other words, he would feel fear when bringing Mary. Why? Why? He might have thought as a righteous Jew, is it appropriate to live as a husband of an, un, a fearful, uh, of an un, unfaithful woman? And, and he must have feared of his future, like, can I really cover everything that she did? And wait, I'm sorry, I lost. Yeah, he might thought like, can I really cover everything that she did and live happily with her for a lifetime? As for the baby, think about, can I really love him as my own son, knowing he is another man's child, be like a good friend and play sports together, teach him man things and raise him? And I thought maybe Mary would be the scariest one, you know, with her growing up in the little village and knowing everybody. He thought he knew her better than anyone else, but is this girl who could commit such a thing really the Mary I knew? Am I going to live with this girl for the rest of my life? Nevertheless, the angel says, do not be afraid to take her. Why and how? Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God conceived her, who, I, who is in the, New Test, in the Old Testament, was sent to those uh, specially designated people of God for his extraordinary works. Through that baby, God gives each of these couples missions in their lives. She will give birth to a son, the baby Jesus, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And father was responsible for naming his son at the time of his circumcision, uh, which is eight days after birth. So by saying that, God commanded that Joseph accept his role as the father of the child. 
By the way, we notice from here that the Bible is cautious about never naming Joseph as the father of Jesus. God says to Joseph, not like, and Joseph, you will have a son. To you will be, uh, will be born, uh, born a son, but to give him the name Jesus. The Bible never calls Joseph as the father of Jesus. And similarly, Matthew 2, 13 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child, not your child, and his mother, not your wife, and, and escape to Egypt. So Joseph is continuously removed from actual fatherhood. And today's New Testament reading, uh, Romans 1, 3, and 4, explains that Romans 1, 3 says, the good news is about his son. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. So Jesus is the legal offspring of Joseph, representing the uh, legitimacy of the descendant of David. Thus, as fully man human, this baby possesses a full range of human characteristics, mentally, emotionally, and outwardly. And verse 4, and he was shown to be the son of man who is fully divine. Yes, Jesus was, Jesus was born from a virgin Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. He possesses a full range of divine characteristics. Therefore, Jesus is the perfect God and man fully human and fully God. And we discover an essential truth about this baby as a perfect God, but easily forgotten. The name of Jesus would be given to this child. His name Jesus in Greek uh, came from the Old Testament Hebrew word Jeshua or Jehoshua, the exact name of Joshua who brought the Israelites into the promised land after the death of Moses. It means Yahweh saves. Yahweh saves. That's the reason he came. Acts 4, 12 says salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. Only the name of Jesus, the one God, man alone, saves. Then from what do we need to be saved? That is because he will save his people from their sins, from their sins. It was not the oppression of Rome, nor the hard life of living political, economic, and social, but that is salvation from our sin. He will rescue his people not from slavery in Egypt, but from the slavery of sin because sin is, is the biggest problem of all humankind. Sin is a root and cause of all human depravity, all evil things, crimes, abuse, sorrow, loneliness, unhappiness, sickness and disease and death, and all of them indeed come from our sins. So we must not overlook our sins. It is so severe. Even to the believers, you know, sin is so powerful and fatal, it destroys all good things about us and separates us from God. And we know very well about that. The most significant loss of all humankind is not the lack of anything like knowledge, money, health, environment, or even family, but the lack of loss of the presence of God, who is the source of everything, but all the more who is called as our home, as Moses said, in whom we experience all the goodnesses that comes from God. And this child born, who is God, only can save his people from their sins. Jesus himself said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So this child will rescue believers from the penalty and power of sin, and he sets us free from all our sins and their result, their trap, their chain, their influence and power, and he removes all condemnation from Satan and covers the guilt of all our past. The true freedom of a soul is to be freed from our sin. The freedom of our soul and mind comes from knowing that we have no obstruction between God and us from which true happiness and joy and boldness and satisfaction uh, come from. 
on the other hand, no matter how one has everything, there is no true freedom in the life of a sinful individual, in a sinful marital relationship, in a sinful family, at work, in society, or the state, but fear. There may be, may be people in the world whose conscience are dead, as Bible says. Still, when anyone faces the almighty and holy creator of the universe, they will be faced with irreversible fear. But the angel clearly mentions the object and scope of salvation for those who are called his people, the church we, uh, who believe in Christ among all nations. The birth of Jesus is a divine incident because all these took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. As it says, has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? The virgin birth of Jesus is the fulfillment of what God had planned and spoken long ago through his prophets and messengers. God has a plan for your life and mine too. Uh, therefore, uh, we do not just live you know, meaninglessly doing the given things by our instincts daily, but live according to God's purpose for we are part of his kingdom. Likewise, God who wants everyone to be saved spoke hundreds of years ago of what must happen to accomplish it. And according to his perfect timing, it was finally achieved through the birth of the baby Jesus. Yes, 23, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And for your reference, the word virgin in Isaiah 7:14, Hebrew word Alma, that can be any young woman of a marriageable age. However, it almost always refers to unmarried virgins. And the Septuagint, ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, selected the Greek word uh, pathanos, which refers to a woman who has never had a sexual relationship. And Isaiah mentions another name instead of Jesus, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Called as Emmanuel together with the name Jesus, Savior of the world from sin, is the other sig significant truth about Jesus Christ. The meaning of Emmanuel, God is with us, is a description of who his child is and the outcomes of his saving work he will bring for all the believers of him. While the name of Jesus saves us from sin, the source of human problems, the name of Emmanuel leads us to the restoration of our relationship with God. Although the Israelites, uh, Israelites' identity was God's chosen people, they offered countless sacrifices and worship. It was just like in the days of uh, Isaiah, only shallow and you know, hard to be accepted for God. Uh, uh, God's fire didn't come down from heaven on the sacrifices. And you know, they celebrated festivals and their lifestyle was so religious there political system was theocracy, which means God and his word, they were the supreme authority of the government and all their culture, customs, language, and life were integrated with their faith in God. However, Emmanuel has been lost for a long time and the presence of God was not experienced in their lives and they knew the concept, but it was a reality not experienced for them. But this child named Emmanuel will bring the presence of God again. Ephesians 2.13, I know I quote it many times, but I want to quote again. Shall we read it together? Ephesians 2.13. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ, that is, through his death, just thus Jesus came to die. And this is the child, Emmanuel, God with us, who is infinitely holy and rich, became poor, took our human nature, entered our sin-polluted life, but without ever being uh, stained by it, he took our, who took our guilt, bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, who was wounded with our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And chapter 3, verse 20, let's read it together. Because of Christ and our faith in him, 
we can now come boldly and comfortably into God's presence because there is no block between God and us in Jesus Christ. The baby Jesus is the head of the church, God's people, and he is the tabernacle, the sanctuary, the meeting place through whom God and his people are connected and meet together. And in Jesus, we can call God Abba Father anytime, and we experience God who is always with us wherever we go. Uh, during last week, I was so appreciated that God was between my wife and I, even though you know, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't doing my best, but still there is Jesus Christ between us. So he always intercedes us and uh, you know, leads our relationship. The church is the community of Emmanuel, God with us. That's why the Lord himself guarantees his presence in the church for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them too. That's the child of Jesus who would be born through the Holy Spirit, who not only came to us, who will come, but also who comes presently and continually into our hearts and lives as our Savior from all our sin and guilt and as Emmanuel, God with us. And now we see the response of Joseph to the words of God de uh, delivered by the angel, 24. Then Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. The moment when we hear the word of God, our worries and strife about all situations end. When God's will is clear, there's no more worrying about how to think, what to do, and what decisions to make, etc. Therefore, the most crucial thing in our life is to listen to God's word. Uh, we call it Rama word, uh, God's word personally given to me and to know his will toward us. And then we obey the word fearlessly. That's the life. Right after he woke up, being confident with what he heard from the angel, he moved it into action precisely was what was commanded without questioning God or laying down uh, conditions. He took Mary home as his wife. So finishing the engagement period, Joseph took Mary to the wedding and 25, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. Yet he remained chaste until after Jesus was born. So by not sleeping with Mary, Joseph contributes to the fulfillment of God's prophecy that a virgin would conceive the Messiah by the Holy Spirit. Obedience does not end with a single decision, but requires continuous patience and self-control. But Matthew narrowly says, until heos, uh, implying that after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had a physical relationship like any other married couple. Therefore, the Catholic claim you know, that Mary remained a virgin all, all her life has no biblical support. The New Testament shows us the Lord's physical brothers and sisters. When Jesus' hometown people heard him preaching in their synagogue, they said, isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, James who wrote the book of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon aren't his sisters, so he had at least two sisters uh, here with us. Then when her son was born and he gave him the name Jesus. Now I want to conclude my sermon today and consider the application. In meditating on today's text, I felt like two things the Lord would uh, speak to us. First is this, look to me, and second, look to you. Look to me and look to you. Who do you see through the story? The baby Jesus is the perfect God and perfect man. He's the perfect son of God, born of a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And let me add the testimony of the Bible about his divinity. Jesus himself said, I am the Alpha and Omega, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Colossians 1, 16, 17, for all things have been created through him and for him, and he existed before anything else, and he, all, he holds all creation together. 
is not only creator, but the sustainer of the universe. In today's New Testament scripture, Romans 1, 5, 6 says how we are related to him. Verse 5, we have been called to believe and obey Jesus, and the purpose is bringing glory to his name, but we also have been called to belong to him. The Lord not only created us, but also purchased us with his own blood when we were lost. So if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Shall we read it together uh, one more time? Romans 14, 8. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So the Son of God became the perfect man. Why? so that Jesus could be fully able to identify with and uh, understand us uh, who has no sin uh, so that he could be the perfect atonement for us sinners. Therefore, he is our Savior and Emmanuel, God with us. He not only saves us by giving us eternal life in heaven, but also he saves us from all our sins and guilt, condemnation, and the power of Satan while we still are living as a sinner with other sinners. His Emmanuel now will be with us forever in heaven only, but who dwells in us, who lives with us, who closely walks with us in every situation of our lives. God is present with his people. He doesn't intervene from a distance, but is always active, expressing his love in unexpected ways and watches over all our concerns. This name, Emmanuel, introduced in Matthew chapter 1, is the theme frame of the whole book. And at the very end, Jesus affirms that he will be with his people to the, to the end of the age. So we hear the commandment, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Look to me, know me, who I am, and know me, what I do for you. Therefore, let us have a Christ-centered Christmas, not a Christmas with the lack of Christ himself because of the busyness of the holiday seasons. And second, I believe our Lord calls us through the text to look to you, look to you. We saw a young, poor, and very ordinary couple socially and economically in a small village, uh, uh, Nazareth. Yet, the man and woman of faith who could sense when God was speaking and who could respond to it with instant belief and submission. We do not have to you know, be a great man or a woman to be God's instrument, but to be mature in what we believe and what we follow in Jesus. And I believe God calls us through this season to grow in faith. Think about it. Has your faith grown more than last Christmas? If not, why don't you take this blessed season to grow in your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus, in your understanding of who he is and what he does, and in your loving and serving him in your daily following Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this season that we remember and celebrate the coming of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who came for us and who will come soon and who constantly is coming to us presently. As we are taught today, help us remember that the name we have, we have saves us from all our sins and their influence and is always with us to the very end of the age. As we continue to remain in your son, Jesus, let him be more apparent in our hearts, minds, family, and all life situations with his presence so that whether we live or die, we may be his and live together with him forever. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. Now please stand and let us praise with him, nothing between. <laughs>
gently visited. Now let us give our tithes and offerings to God. Now please join me in offertory prayer. Gracious one, you have restored us in body and in soul. You have given us abundant life, more than we could have ever imagined. You have made your face shine upon us to make us whole. Holy one, bless now the offerings of our hearts and lives that we might shine as you shine and share your blessings with others. pray. May the grace of Christ of our Lord and Savior and the Father's boundless love with the Holy Spirit's favor rest upon you from above. Amen.